uh, of 500,000 dirhams or taxes, Ardebil about 100,000, and it's at the time that Yazgir has gone to Kerman, Sistan and Marban has been murdered. So as Yazgir is moving up to Khorasan, these provinces are accepting to pay jizya and whatnot. And I'll talk about the methods in which the Muslims and the Iranians dealt with each other during the Islamic conquest. There were various uh, avenues of contact and decisions to be made. But we know, uh, according to the historical sources, literary sources, for example, if you look at the province of Fars, which I know a little bit more, uh, the city of Estaq was conquered between 648 and 649, two years before the death of Yadke. The city of Gub, Firuzaba, 649-650. Shiraz, 640-641, much earlier. Daragir, 643-644. So there are various dates given for the conquest. Now, I have problems with all of these dates. What does it mean that a city was conquered? Because we know several of these cities rose up every time it was conquered. Agreed, you know, there was slaughter. For example, Estaq is the most famous one. Uh, I forgot now who mentions that 40,000 nobility and just cavalry are killed from the city of Estaq. The blood sort of flows into the street, uh, we are told. Um, I think Estaq mentions that. Uh, in Fars, you know, there are these round figures given 100,000 that are killed. Uh, and so what I think we can see uh, in the literary sources is not the numbers that are true, but there's constant revolt and resubduing of the cities. That is, uh, a city either loses or agrees to pay you know, their taxes to them. And then they install an Amir, the Muslims, and then the people revolt and kill that Amir. The Muslims come back again to squash the revolt, and then killing goes on. And this is going on all through the seventh century between 640 to 670. For about 30 years, about, about three decades, this is going on. But especially when Yazgard is alive and I think the century after that. Now, another evidence for us, beside the literary sources that sometimes may not be the best source, are the, as I said, the coinage, the numismatic sources. Not only the Sasanian ones, but what would be called the Arab Sasanian, especially the anonymous Arab Sasanian. Uh, so this, if this is a Sasanian, this is an Arab Sasanian. What is the difference? Well, it has a legend of Bismillah here. Well, this one is a bit later than anonymous. Hajjaj ibn uh, Yusuf's name is actually written in Arabic. But before this, we have the name of the Amirs written in Pahlavi uh, on these coins, which is, again, interesting. And the image of Khosrow, the sacred fire altar, the king's fire altar, is still there. But this is an Arab Sasanian coinage. This is a coinage that the Muslims have. By tracing these coinage, we know what years the Arabs were uh, controlling that city, and then you get actually a non-Arab Sasanian, a Sasanian one on top of that. That shows that people have revolted and are minting this other coinage. This way uh, gives us a very interesting uh, view of things. I have just to, again, as I told you, put this 200-page thing uh, short together. If you look at the last years of uh, Yazgar's coinage with that of the earliest Arab Sasanian coinage, and compare it with historians such as Tabari, Balkhi and Beladari, uh, two important or uh, three important sources for the dates that the cities of Ardashir Kure, Bishapur, Dara, Gerd, Estah, Be'azami, Kobad, these are cities in Fars. As to when they were conquered, you come to some very interesting conclusions. And this is what the conclusions are. Dates given by the literary texts, Beladari, Tabari, Estahri, uh, Balami, and others. For the conquest of the following cities are always earlier than the anonymous Arab Sasanian coinage. So the coinage, which I tend to trust more, uh, tend to say that these cities weren't conquered so quickly. And probably the first time the cities were conquered, uh, that date was used in the literary sources. Although the literary sources also uh, are not unison in their description. And that should tell us again that there were further revolts. Arab Sasanian coins begin with the first year after Yazgir's death. His rule was recognized till his death, at least in Fars, at least the initial part. There are discrepancies for the date of the conquest in the literary and the numismatic evidence, as I have just mentioned. So, does the Sasanian Empire come to an end with the death of Yazgir? That has been the traditional idea. Nowadays, there has been further work done that while Yazgir was murdered in 651 by uh, an Iranian or a miller from for our son, uh, Yazgir had sent his sons and daughter to the east, further all the way to China. Remember I t told you about Antonio Forte and his studies on uh, uh, what Yazgir was willing to pay in China. 
And we're told that uh, Piruz, one of the sons of Yadgir, goes to the Chinese emperor to ask for help. And indeed, he's given uh, a force of Turco-Chinese uh, army and is able to establish what is called the Second Persian Sasanian Kingdom in what we think is Zarak in Sistan. This uh, is also corroborated by Tabari. Tabari also tells us. So it seems for a while that while with the death of Yazgird, uh, things were all lost, there is this last effort by the son of Yazgird, one of the two, to come back and indeed establish something based on operation from uh, what we call now, of course, uh, um, beyond a modern day Iranian a nation state. And uh, what we call the Second Sasanian Rule, Sistan. And this independence or rule uh, begins in 658, about seven years after he has all the way to 673. So still there are Sasanians in 673 claiming to be king of kings, legitimate kings, and they're there to take it back. So this idea that the Sasanian family were these weakling rulers who at the end just ran away is again another modern myth. Uh, really, again, due to modern uh, historiography, uh, the way things are written in Iran. In fact, we know Piruz was in Sistan, and uh, by 673, we're told that he returns to China. And even by 675, he was attempting to take back the Sasanian Empire. Uh, I have written a short article about these very strange coinage of Yazgir, the third for year 20. We have hundreds of them from Sistan. And the question is, why these coinage? You know, he's, he wasn't there that long. Why there's this large number of coinage with the name of Yazgir? And sometimes on the margin, it has a slogan, free. I have suggested that this, in fact, is the coinage minted by Pius and his other son. And since there were two sons, none of them put their names. In fact, they still uh, minted in the name of Yazgir, the, the last ruler that at least for many seemed to have been important. We know in China, Piruz was given uh, the title of general uh, as a grandee in the Chinese court. He seems to have built temples uh, in Xinjiang and died in 679. In fact, now, uh, we do have a statue that is in China with an inscription that my Sinologist friend has translated for me, and Forte, I think, has worked on it and done so as well which uh, says Piruz, the king of Persia, the general of the right flank, and the spotlight of Persia. So uh, these Sasanians, at least, family was in China in the late seventh century. But that's not it. Piruz's son, Narsen, 679, is not going to give up, and actually fights the Arab Muslims for another 30 years, until 709 CE, until the eighth century CE, the Sasanian family is trying to get back the Sasanian Empire, where, of course, they're unsuccessful and come back to become the general of the left flank. There are still more of the Sasanian family who are trying to come back. The other son of Yazgir is Bahram, who in the Chinese sources, according to Forte, is called Aluhan, who he has, of course, identified with the name Bahram. And he seems to have traveled to Byzantium, to the other side, trying to receive aid from the Byzantine Empire. So one son goes to the east, one son goes to the west, trying to gain help. Now, here there is a nice uh, Pahlavi, if you want to call it, poem. Sometimes people call it a Persian poem with uh, you know, Pahlavi script, uh, called Abar Madana Bahram Barzavan, and the coming of Bahram, the miraculous, miraculous power. This is a middle Persian poem of the hope and desires of uh, the, uh, you know, Zoroastrians that Bahram would come and destroy the mosque, raise the mosque, and establish fire temple. This was always co connected uh, to the savior in the Zoroastrian tradition. Now, I think at a conference, uh, others, including Carlo Ceretti, has shown that this, in all probability, is, in fact, Bahram, the other son of Yazgird, uh, who is being seen as the great savior, as he has gone to uh, the West. In fact, in the Bundahishan, uh, an important Zoroastrian encyclopedic source. It is mentioned that when the Romans arrive and organize the rule for a year, at that time from the district of Kabbalistan, right, from the east, someone will come whose glory is from the family of the lords, they call him Kevahra. So it may be, again, a reference in the Bundesh and also to this other son, rather than the savior that 
uh, we see in the Zoroastrian tradition, and the two traditions perhaps coalesce together. Okay, that is what seems to have happened. Uh, here is part of that uh, text on the coming of Bahram, the miraculous Bahram. So when will he come uh, and you know save? Um, Iranians and see what the Arabs have done to uh, this, you know, fragrant gardens of the Iranians that they have taken, so on, so on. So that's uh, something that very much in the nationalist uh, circles of Iranians regarding Arab conquest. If you want to get its ancient text, just go to this poem, and you'll see exactly what these people are thinking of the Arab Muslims, uh, probably in seventh or eighth century. So this is the coinage or the last great coinage of the Sasanian world uh, minted by uh, Piruz and Bahram. Even Bahram's son, Khosrow, who in uh, Chinese sources called Julo, or Julo, uh, Johan knows Chinese uh, quite good in it, so he would be correcting my pronunciation, but uh, with apologies, is also mentioned to have uh, asked the Turks to help uh, retake Iran Shah, but is unable. To conclude, uh, I would say the first part, well, no, more than the first part of my talk, so if you could just bear with me a little bit longer. The fall of the Sasanian Empire was due to internal dynastic fighting. That we know, and we uh, look at the three periods that I suggested, right? Generals of the empire militarized the empire, in a sense, tried to take over the empire. If you know your Roman history, that sounds like third century Roman Empire or the 4th century, or the 3rd century, which is barrack emperors. Sounds very much like where uh, generals are just, uh, or armies are raising their own general as the emperor. Of course, the emperor sometimes lasts a couple of days and is assassinated. And then another general is raised. And that seems to be the case, for me, at least in the late Sasanian Empire in the 7th century, what is going on. So multiple rulers, or generals, ruling over uh, the Sasanian Empire. And as I mentioned, the only way to explain how so many kings and queens minted coins in less than a decade is that they were ruling at the same time in various ways. Also, only after 650, it is only after then that the Arab Muslims were able to mint coins in Fars. That's the province I know that they want. And the numismatic evidence suggests this theory but pushes the date back to 651 and 652, a year after. And I think there were ideological reasons why Yazgir III's coin in the Sistan were minted with the year 20 because of the two sons. Lastly, the Sasanian family still hoped to conquer Iran Shah in the 8th century, so things aren't finished by 650, and Arab Muslims were able nominally to get access to the city. Okay. Arab Iranian encounter. So let's look at practicalities. What happens when Arabs and uh, uh, Muslims and the, S the Sasanians or the Iranians meet? Well, there are various scenarios. One, uh, the Muslims give several options to the conquerors, or the, to the conqueror. Convert, become part of Islam. Or, except Muslim rule, you don't need to become a Muslim. You pay tribute, but keep freedom, practice your own religion. But you can't do this once you fight, mind you. Either you submit right away, you can't fight and lose and then say, okay, I'll pay my jizya. By then, you probably are taken into slavery or your uh, women and children. You know, all sorts of nasty things come to you. It reminds me again like the Romans, what they did to the Carthaginians and sort of these imperial uh, forms of um, terrorism, I would say. Uh, or you could resist and fight, which ended in death, slavery, and paying even more for their release. That was even worse. And so these were the options that were put before the cities that were ruled by uh, Ostandar or the Shahdars, or sometimes the Magi or the priests. So it depends if there was a Marzban, if there was a Magi or the uh, Mubet, that is a priest who was in charge or a general uh, protecting the province or the city to decide to pay a poll tax, uh, to pay tribute, or fight and die. And we have various versions of it, depending on the locality that we're looking. So the province of Fars doesn't look like province of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan doesn't look like Khorasan. Khorasan doesn't look like Sistan. We cannot make general assumptions about the entire thing. Once every single province is studied, then one can actually bring together all of these studies and notes. Michael Morney has studied Iraq. I have studied Fars. Harbani Pushayati has studied Khorasan. 